Welcome to About Scripture, a podcast designed to take the listener deeper into Scripture and biblical thought. I'm Ed Gallagher, Professor of Christian Scripture at Heritage Christian University. I hope to cover a variety of topics with you about Scripture. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Heritage Christian University, where we help students to thrive in ministry. To find out more, go to hcu.edu. We're also partnering with the Ministry League Network. They have free resources to help the local church all over the world. Download the app in the iOS or Play Store, or check out the website at ministryleague.com. And now, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. This semester, I will be talking about the Greek language. Usually what that'll mean is uh, I'll talk about a particular Greek word and what we can get out of it, how to study it, how to think through it. Uh, I'm not going to start there today. Uh, Today I'm going to talk about what language Jesus spoke as relevant to Bible study in general and to the topic that we have for this semester, the the value of, I'm going to say the topic of this semester is the value of studying Greek, All right? But we're starting with what language did Jesus speak? This is a difficult question. Uh, the basic answer to the question, what the question is, what language did Jesus speak? The basic answer is we do not know. Uh, we can't, I would say, we can't say for sure uh, but there are indications. There, there are limited options, right? There are limited options as to what the answer to that question could be. I'm pretty certain he did not speak French. Uh, he did not speak, you know, English. Uh, there, there are many languages we can say for sure that was not the language of Jesus. There are limited options. The options are limited basically, I would say, to two Aramaic primary candidate. Um, Greek, that's the dark horse candidate. And then if you want to throw in a third one, Hebrew, we should talk about that as well. Probably not Latin. Some people around Jesus were speaking Latin. It seems doubtful that Jesus would have grown up speaking Latin and would have taught in Latin, even though no doubt he did hear that language being spoken from time to time. But the options are basically he, uh, Hebrew as, as maybe something we should consider, but Aramaic and Greek. How do you get at this kind of thing? All of the documents that we have in the New Testament are written in Greek. All of them are written in Greek all the way through. All right, Matthew to Revelation, it's all in Greek. There is no other language in there. Okay, now, as opposed to the Hebrew Bible, which is not just Hebrew, in fact, there is another language represented in the Old Testament, not just Hebrew, but also Aramaic. There are some passages in the Old Testament that are written in not Hebrew, but Aramaic. Not a whole lot. What is there, 989 chapters in the Old Testament? Is that right? And 10 of them, more or less, are written in Aramaic. Mostly, you're going to find your Aramaic in the book of Daniel, but you're going to find some other Aramaic in uh, Ezra, and you'll find a verse of Aramaic in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10, verse 11 is written in Aramaic. And then there are a couple of words in Aramaic in Genesis 31, verse 47. So that's the Hebrew Bible, which is not just Hebrew. There is a little bit of Aramaic in there as well. But the New Testament, it's all in Greek. But there are some words written in Greek that are not native Greek words. They come from other languages. So Aramaic, for instance. And that could give us a clue as to the language that Jesus spoke. But how to get at the question is a little bit difficult. If you you look outside the New Testament, well, I mean, so one, one way we might think about it is 
all of the teaching that we have from Jesus is in Greek, right? You read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, it's in Greek. So does that mean that Jesus spoke it in Greek? Well, I mean, it's a possibility. Let's, let's reserve that for a moment. What if we looked outside the Bible and we saw that there were inscriptions? Let's say that there, we go to a, a, a synagogue and there are inscriptions on the walls, and maybe we would want to say, well, the language that those inscriptions are written in, that must be the language that people actually spoke. And that is a possibility. Um, I, I imagine that is what is going on in John 19, verse 20, when we read about the accusation against Jesus. Do y'all remember the, the accusation, the king of the Jews, and this was the accusation that led to Jesus' death, at least from the Roman perspective. The reason they put him to death is because he said that he was king of the Jews or he presented himself or people thought he was or something like that. Something about uh, leading an insurrection against Rome. That was the accusation against Jesus that led to his death. And it was written in three languages. This is what John 19 verse 20 tells us. There are three languages represented here. Uh, and if you look in the Greek New Testament, those languages are called Hebrew, Roman, and Hellenistic. Of course, when it says Roman, I'm pretty certain it means Latin. And when it says Hellenistic, I know it means Greek. Now, why would the accusation against Jesus be written in these languages? I would imagine it's because those are the languages that maybe people passing by might read those languages. It wants to communicate to the normal person, more or less. Latin, maybe not so much, but that's for the, the people from Rome that happen to be there in Palestine. It's in Greek because some people are expected to know Greek. It's in a language that is called Hebrew in the, in the verse. John 19, 20 says it was written in Hebrew. Now, that's if you look in the Greek New Testament. If you look in your English translation, I don't know what that language is going to be called. It's variable. If you're looking in the ESV, I looked this up in that one, the ESV says it's Aramaic. You know, so, so if you read some English Bibles, they're going to say that the accusation against Jesus was written in Latin and Greek and Aramaic. Well, the actual Greek word there is Hebraisti, Hebrew. But does it mean Hebrew, like we think of Hebrew, or does it mean Aramaic? Well, obviously, some Bible translators think it actually means Aramaic even though the word itself is Hebrew. There is a different Greek word, by the way, that means Aramaic, suristi, in Syrian or Aramaic. But does the Greek word Hebrew point us to Hebrew or does it point us to Aramaic? That is an open question, in my mind at least. It's not an open question in everybody's mind. Some New Testament scholars think it's, the question is closed. When the New Testament says Hebrew, it means Aramaic. Um, so, for instance, in Acts 22, Paul quiets the crowd, and he speaks to them, not in Greek, but in some Semitic language that is called in the text, in the Greek New Testament, Hebrew. And the crowd hears him speaking in this language, and they quiet down. It says, the, the text says, when they heard him speaking in this language, they quieted down. Now, again, your Bibles might say that he was speaking in Hebrew. The Greek word is Hebrew, but your Bibles in, in English might say that he was speaking in Hebrew. Some of them might say he was speaking in Aramaic. Which one was it? Was he speaking in Hebrew or Aramaic? I don't know. New Testament scholars generally think it was Aramaic, but I think a good argument can be made that, well, when it says Hebrew, it means Hebrew, and that that's the reason the crowd quieted down is because Paul was not speaking in the normal language of the Jewish population, but he was speaking in the holy language of the population, and so the quiet crowd quieted down at that point. But I just go over this to say, even when we have documentation that uh, that 
someone was speaking in a particular language, that doesn't always mean that we even know what the name of the language is indicating. Is it indicating this language or that language? It, it can be complicated. And when we find, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, when we find inscriptions on synagogue walls, let's say they're written in Greek or let's say they're written in Hebrew or whatever it is, do we get from that, well, then the, when the synagogue met, they must have conversed with each other in this language that is on their walls. And when they read the Bible, they read the Bible in the language that's on the walls. Well, I mean, maybe. Maybe, but I have known people, and maybe you have too, who have gotten tattoos on their skin in a language that they did not speak. And in fact, they knew so little about that language that they had to ask somebody else, can you give me the right word for this tattoo so I can have it imprinted because I don't know the language at all. And maybe that language is Hebrew, and maybe that language is Latin, and maybe that language is Mandarin Chinese, or something else. Examples abound. Examples abound also, I mean, there are websites dedicated to the mess-ups of people who decide to do this kind of thing, getting tattoos of a language they don't know. Well, certainly getting a tattoo of a language does not necessarily mean that you speak that language. It, what, what is that? Why do people get tattoos in a language they don't know? Because it, it, it signifies, so, they want to project something. I, I'm not sure, you know, it could be different things, some sort of spirituality perhaps, or elitism maybe, I, I don't know. But that just goes, that, that's an indication that maybe the inscriptions on the synagogue walls don't necessarily tell us about the language that the people were actually speaking, but it just tells us the language they wanted to put up on their walls for whatever reason. In fact, just yesterday I was walking through a building, not on this campus, I don't know if we have any on this campus, but up on the building, there was, um, there was a sign in Latin, and I am fairly confident most people walking through that building would not have ever studied Latin or ever care to study Latin and wouldn't know what the sign said if they looked up at it, but there, it was a university, so there was a sign in Latin that projects something that the university wants to say about itself. It doesn't mean that the people at the university know Latin or that Latin is the language of instruction and teachers teach their students in Latin. It doesn't say that at all. So all of that to say, the question can be a little bit difficult to even get at what is the evidence for us? What language did Jesus speak? The candidates I mentioned are, are Aramaic and Greek. Those are the main candidates. Hebrew is uh, a possibility also, and of course, we should leave open the possibility that he was multilingual. And of course, when I talk about this, I am thinking of Jesus as, I believe certain things about Jesus, okay? But when I'm thinking through this question, I'm thinking about Jesus, the human being, and not someone who can access divine knowledge. So of course, he could speak English because he knew English a thousand years before it was even invented. I'm not thinking through the question in that way. Right? So if, if Jesus wanted to speak Mandarin Chinese, he certainly could have. Okay, fine. But from a human perspective, what language would he have been speaking? What language did he grow up speaking and hear and would he have taught in so that people could understand him? Let's talk about Aramaic for a second. So Aramaic is a good possibility for that language. That is the common answer, in fact. And I think it's a pretty good answer. Okay, so that's where I am on that. Uh, Aramaic... As I already mentioned, there is some Aramaic in the Old Testament. There's this interesting verse, actually, in 2 Kings 18.26 that mentions Aramaic. This is before the Jews, as a whole, had latched onto Aramaic as a language that they communicated in. So this is before the exile. That's another way of saying this is before the exile. This is the uh, Assyrian invasion of Judah in 701 BC. Uh, so we're talking about during the reign of Hezekiah, this verse, 2 Kings 18, verse 26, then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, these are Judean officials, said to the Rabshakeh, the Rabshakeh is an Assyrian official. He's from the Assyrian king. 
Please speak to your servants in the Aramaic language, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. So the, what they're saying is the normal Judeans don't speak Aramaic. The normal Judeans just speak Hebrew, that is to say, the language of Judah. We officials of the Judean king, we speak the international language of Aramaic. And so we'd really appreciate it if you would speak to us, you know, we might uh, speak to us in Latin and not in English because everybody understands English. We don't want you to scare these people that don't know Latin. So let's talk in the highfalutin language rather than the common language is essentially what 2 Kings 18.26 is getting at. So this is before Aramaic became a language that Jews commonly spoke. Aramaic is already an international language of the Assyrian Empire. It would continue to be an international language of the Neo-Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. It would continue to be an international language under the Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great and all those guys that were finally overthrown by Alexander the Great when Greek became the more standard international language. But by that time, Jews had been living uh, in an Aramaic-speaking environment for quite some time, and at some point they adopted Aramaic, it seems, as a language that they commonly used. At some point, they translated their Bible from Hebrew into Aramaic. And we have some Aramaic translations of the Bible called Targumim. At some point, they started going to the synagogue and they would read the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, but then they would translate it into Aramaic. I keep saying at some point, because when did all this happen is a little hairy, but, you know, sometime around the time of Jesus, maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after. I mean, maybe Nehemiah 8, where Ezra comes and reads the Bible out loud, maybe already at that point. What is it? Nehemiah 8.8 8 says that they uh, that he read the Bible and then there were people explaining it. Does that mean they were translating it into a language that the people could understand? Maybe. It doesn't exactly say that, but maybe it means that. So maybe already at the time of Ezra they needed help with Hebrew because they spoke Aramaic more readily. If you look at the inscriptions in Palestine around the time of the first century, there's good reason to believe from the inscriptions that Aramaic was a commonly spoken language. There you might think, well, I've already sort of uh, spoken a, a caveat about using inscriptions to, um, to judge the common language of the people, but you might think, well, you can imagine a good reason why somebody might put an inscription in Hebrew, that's the holy language, or Greek, that's the international language. But is there a good reason other than that I speak this language that you would put it in Aramaic? It seems less likely that you're going to do it, put the inscription in Aramaic, unless you think this is going to communicate to people more broadly. I hope that makes sense. So there are a lot of Aramaic inscriptions, and so it seems like that would be a pretty common language, especially in Galilee where Jesus grew up, that that would make sense as a language that he would have spoken. Eventually, uh, Jews in general, or at least rabbinic Jews, um, started writing their literature in Aramaic. The, the earliest rabbinic document, as it, we usually think of it, is the Mishnah from about 200 A.D., it's in Hebrew, but after that, it's Aramaic more generally. The Talmud, for instance, the commentary on the mission is typically in Aramaic, and then after that, Aramaic uh, continues to be uh, prominent in Jewish culture. So we, we are on this continuum where Aramaic is very prominent. But if you look in the first century Palestine and look for inscriptions, in synagogues, you will also find quite a number of Greek inscriptions. And Greek was a very prominent language in Palestine in the first century. And so we can't rule out the idea that Jesus may have been able to communicate in Greek. In fact, um, you know, there, there are these conversations in the Gospels represented between Jesus and some non-Jewish person, Pilate, for instance, 
Now, we have this conversation between Jesus and Pilate in, let's say, John 18. It doesn't say that they're using a translator between them. That seems like the kind of detail that could very easily be left out, let's be honest, right? It may be, maybe John just doesn't tell us they were using a translator, but Jesus, maybe Jesus was speaking Aramaic, Pilate was speaking Greek, and there was a translator, and he just doesn't tell us. <clears throat> could it be that, I'm, I'm pretty confident Pilate was not speaking Aramaic. Could it be that Jesus was speaking Greek to Pilate? Seems like a possibility that, that we should not um, you know, rule out But is that the language that Jesus usually spoke? Well, we do have this evidence in the Gospels of language that Jesus spoke. I've already told you that the Gospels are completely, like the entire New Testament, completely written in Greek, including the teaching of Jesus is all in Greek. The Sermon on the Mount is all in Greek. Except there are some words stuck in there that are actually not Greek words that come from Semitic sources. So for instance, even in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 22, raka, you all remember that word? It's not a Greek word, that's an Aramaic word. Why would, Je why would Matthew preserving the words of Jesus put in this Aramaic word? Maybe that's an indication of the language that Jesus was actually speaking and most of it is translated for us into Greek because that was the common language that uh, Matthew wanted to communicate in so that many, many people could read this thing. But what, when Jesus was actually speaking in a context dominated by Aramaic speakers, he was actually speaking Aramaic. And so the language of the sermon originally was Aramaic. In fact, if you want to find that kind of evidence, Matthew is not the real gospel to turn to. It's Mark. Mark is the one that preserves more of these Aramaic expressions from our Lord. For instance, Mark 5.41, Talitha kum. Mark 7.34, Ephaphtha. Mark 7.11, Korban. Mark 14.36, Abba. Most of those are definitely Aramaic expressions. Ephaphtha is possibly Aramaic, possibly Hebrew, uh, but most of them are definitely Aramaic expressions. Um, and then there's the one that was read for us earlier, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that Jesus spoke from the cross. That's the one that I, in my mind, this is the smoking gun. Because why, this is not Greek, of course, and it's not Hebrew either. It's Aramaic. But do you know where those words come from? Jesus, from the cross, is quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was not written in Aramaic. Psalm 22 was written in Hebrew. So you would think if Jesus is going to quote the psalm, he would either quote it according to the original, maybe the Hebrew, or he would quote it in the language that he is accustomed to hearing it and speaking. It seems like to me that would be the most obvious ways of going with this. And he quotes it in Aramaic. I can't imagine why in the world would he quote that psalm in Aramaic unless that was the language that he typically spoke and he thought would communicate to the people that he is used to communicating with. The people around would understand what he was doing. As it turned out, the people around had no idea what he was talking about. They thought he was calling Elijah or something. But he was quoting Psalm 22, not in the Hebrew, but in Aramaic. That seems to me, as I say, to be the smoking gun that Jesus spoke Aramaic. And if that is the case, what that means for us, like this is sort of the, I don't know if you would call this a payoff, but it is something worthy of thinking about. The theological something worthy of thinking about. What that would mean is we do not have the original words of Jesus in their original language. What we have is translation.
And that should affect the way we think about what we have in the words of Jesus and what we have in the Bible. In fact, probably all of us are just accustomed to using, I think all of us would be accustomed to using, uh, a Bible in translation. And is that the Bible or not? Well, when we look at the words of Jesus, most likely, I, I, I still hesitate to say for sure or definitely, but most likely, what we have is not the original language words of Jesus, but we have translation. And it was the translation of the words of Jesus that his disciples disseminated and did not think it was necessary to bring uh, the original words uh, in Aramaic to the far off lands, but thought that God could communicate to people in translation. Now, that you might think this is an argument against studying Greek, and in some ways it is. It is an argument that the translation of the Bible, God can communicate and does communicate to people in translation. On the other hand, the original language is something that has been for the Bible, I mean Hebrew, Greek, New Testament, is something that has been preserved for us and as people dedicated to understanding more and more about God, it also offers insights to us. We should um, be temperate in what we expect to get out of a study of Greek. Often I think what you will find is that people think it will revolutionize their study of the Bible and their understanding of God. And if that happens, it happens over the course of decades and decades rather than weeks and months. It takes years and years and years, decades as I say, to find that your understanding of God and of the Bible has been affected and changed by studying Greek and that is an encouragement to you to keep with it, to keep going, and God will continue to reveal himself in these texts that we hold so dear. Thank you.